Hi, my name's Cathy Millett, and I want to share with you how I made this stunning rock face diorama in one six scale. Now, it may be one six scale, but a lot of the techniques I've used on this will work in any scale. They just get a little bit more fiddly as you get smaller. I've made trees the same way in HO's scale. Rock face, well, you can do this in any scale. And 3D printing, well, it's whatever size you print it in. Actually, the smaller they are, the easier it will be. So the diorama started with this figure. She's a part of the Blind Prophet Saga by Dogmill Snow, part of a limited edition custom figure run. And I absolutely love her. She comes with swords, shield, stunning. So I put down on paper what I wanted it to look like. Rock face, figure, wolves above her, and then a stunted tree. And I'd been wanting to use these wolves for ages. They're a printed obsession, and you can get them on my mini factory. And although they're made for tabletop gaming, you can blow them up to really large sizes and they still look amazing. So I printed it as big as my build plate would print. Hmm, looks more like a dog, actually a small puppy by comparison to a similar size figure. So I split it into six pieces in mesh mixer, very easy to do, hollowed it out in my chitterbox slicer, and then printed it on my any cubic photon. I did it in both green and white resin, which is why it looks a bit odd. I then just had to sand any areas that I put supports on, and I was very careful not to put supports anywhere particularly visible. It's not entirely possible, but I put them mostly on the flat edges, which were gonna join up. I wet sanded because resin dust is not the best things for your lungs. So just a spot of water onto your sanding. I also use metal files then for the sanding of the more final, fine details. Then all I needed to do was glue them together. I used Gorilla Super Glue. I actually put a little bit too much on it, oozed out the edge. At this point, a little zapper, it's a spray super glue kicker, is perfect for stopping it all falling apart while you're waiting for it to set. Then all you need to do is fill the gaps, and there will be sun, partly because where you print, the supports distort slightly, so I found none of my edges quite met perfectly. But this is an acrylic plastic putty. I put it on with a brush. For any areas where you could see print lines from the printer, such as here, and then sanded it all smooth, mostly using emery boards. This actually took quite a while. Once I'd done a first pass of sanding, I then sprayed some just Halford's Car Primer. It's a nice solid coat, sticks well to resin. And you can see areas that are white have been sanded, areas that are gray have not been sanded yet, and are actually holes that I still need to fill. So I just refilled them, waited for it to dry, and sanded again. There's a lot of filling and sanding when you do 3D printing, a lot. Up, I added some fur texture just using acrylic plastic putty that I used for all the filling. It's very, very simple to do. You brush it on with quite a monkey brush so it's got very coarse bristles and it puts a beautiful fur texture on that when you come to paint makes all the difference. It's also useful for filling any seams you're not quite happy with and I even did it on the face but very, very carefully and with much smaller strokes, just so there was detail all over this wolf. And finally, we're on to painting. I used flat white Tamiya with a couple of drops of desert yellow just to warm it up. And I gave a nice solid coat all over the models just to get rid of any green showing through from the print beneath. Using a bunch of reference photos I got off the internet, I put on a patchy coat of desert yellow across his back. I want it to look slightly uneven because the fur does. I made sure I did his face as well, and that was a little bit of delicate work with the airbrush. I have to admit, I'm not great at airbrushing, so I'm really chuffed how these have come out. Um, so I think the answer is, have a go. Um, if you're not good at something, you can always overpaint it and do it again. This is where the texture I put on earlier came into its own. I used a rough brush and a small amount of flat black Tamiya and I dabbed it off well. So this is dry brushing and it just catches all of those rough bits of plastic putty that I'd put on that had created a fur effect. And I was able to use the photos I had to put it in the correct places on the wolf. I went down the legs a bit with a bit more of the brown, um, the desert yellow colour, just to highlight a little bit darker instead of using the black, which looked a little bit too stark. But I wanted to make sure that that fur texture came out on the legs as well, even though they're quite pale in colour. 
I cracked out a really small stumpy brush that I have for doing the same around the face where there's a lot more detail required. And then it's on to the hand painting of the eyes and mouth and nose. Now I use flat black Tamiya for this. It takes a steady hand and I have the wolf braced on the workbench. I have my hand braced on the workbench and my hand that's actually doing the painting is I use the little finger to brace it as well. So nothing is being done in midair because you'll just wobble. I used a yellowy colour with a little bit of gold mixed in to do the eyes and I, I painted the black, then I painted the yellow, then I painted the black over the top. And not to worry if you do splodge at all, a little bit of cottonwood soaked in water will get it off very quickly. And here they are, a key piece of the diorama finished. Now I need to get them in place and I need to do them first so I could see where they fit. But in the meanwhile, don't they look scary? Oof. All good dioramas start with a plan. So the first thing I did was work out where my rock face was going, where my tree was going, campfires, where the lady would stand, where the wolves would go. And I realized it's gonna be a big diorama. I also realized it's gonna be a tall diorama, which I wasn't quite expecting. She, I knew she was 12 inches tall. I just didn't realize how big it was gonna make this height wise. Once I'd done that, I scribbled it all onto a piece of foam core and I cut a rough outline around the outside. This is more for guidance, as by the time I've stuck everything on the foam, everything will change anyway. I drew round it onto a second piece of foam core for a little bit of rigidity and then cut that out too. I glued the two pieces together with just normal white glue. I buy it five litres at a time and used a disposable brush to spread it all out. I put both pieces together and put loads of bricks and weights on to make sure they stayed nice and flat. I've had problems with foam core curling in the past um, if it's glued on one side and not on the other. Next up came layers and layers of foam. Now I'm using Celotex or some other brand of UK house insulation. You can't use hot wire tools on it because it's fireproof as all insulation is in the UK now. So if you see me using insulation with hot wire tools, it's probably really old stuff that I bought ages ago. Um, Gorilla glue is great because it will expand slightly, but none of these glues the work that well on the foam because sadly it's very powdery and the outer layer will just come off very easily. So the glue is very firmly attached to a layer of powder. So I just put the glue on, smush it around, spray it with a little bit of water and then put the foam on top. It's really important to put weights on because Gorilla Glue expands and it will actually push things apart if you're not careful. So make sure that everything you use is weighted well whilst it's drying. And repeat again and again. Now I didn't realize it at the time, but this foam was excellent. Despite the fact that it's not my favorite because you can't use hot tools on it, I cracked out my heat gun, which gets very, very hot for a later stage. And actually where I used it near some white expanded polystyrene foam that I'd put right at the front, that foam just melted away to nothing. So this foam is great for the next stage. And it had the plus bonus, these were offcuts from a friend's extension, so they were free. You really can't beat free. One top tip though, do take the aluminium foil off. It is actually conductive, and I can think of people who have had shorts mysteriously appear on their model railway and couldn't work out why, and it's because the foil was touching their rails. When all the glue is well and truly dry, you can start carving it. I find a kitchen knife is best for this. Now, to be honest, this is quite a scary stage. I turned it upside down so I had the base at the bottom so I could see what I was cutting out. But quite frankly, um, take care with this stage. It is very dangerous. You're cutting a lot of foam with a sharp knife and do use a sharp knife, it will take forever. Always cut away from you and be very mindful where your hand is, especially your fingers. From time to time, I checked that my key parts still fitted. However, despite measuring, I didn't get this bit right. So bear in mind, you don't always get it right the first time. What is nice about this foam is you can just put your knife point in and break out pieces. It does 
um, shatter very easily, which makes it great to get great looking rock faces. Unfortunately, it's far too soft to use in any meaningful way. So I do wonder about putting epoxy or something out, resin, like something like that on the outside, but I haven't experimented on that yet. So instead I cover it completely in the next stage. So having decided I needed a covering for my rock face, I wanted to use EVA foam. I've been wanting to use this for a while. I actually got into cosplay because I started Googling EVA foam as an idea for using it for a rock face. Saw so cosplay and I used this to make my Mirror Emperor Giorgio costume. Now I was determined to try some new lightweight products and one of those is foam clay. You can get it all over the place. Um, it's popular in cosplay so it's having a bit of a resurgence at the moment but basically it's foam that you can mould like a clay. Very useful and lightweight and when it's dry you can dremel it and do all sorts of things with it. Now why did I choose EVA foam? Well it's readily available um, and certainly in the US, you can get it in Joann's now under the cosplay section. So as that's a very popular hobby, you see more and more of this coming around. You can get thin two mil sheets in Hobbycraft, which is called Craft Foam, or you can get this thicker stuff, and this is three or five mil, and this is what I mostly used. If you heat it up, it closes the pore so you can see it changes color and it becomes soft and you can bend it very easily. And then when it cools down, it keeps its shape. Magic. I basically made my entire rock face by cutting up pieces of EVA foam and sticking them back together again. To glue them together, mark your overlap between the two pieces with a metallic or white pen, something that will show up on black. Don't forget to mark the back too. Then apply contact cement. This is just Evo Stick Impact. Apparently barge is good if you're in the US. Um, put a thin layer, slightly thinner than this. This is just newly filled up my dispenser and it was coming out in great big globs. But a thin layer on both sides and leave it to dry on the side for about 10 minutes. When dry, the two pieces will just stick together as if by magic. So just push them together and firmly press them down. Now this does not look like a rock face, does it? And that's where the Dremel comes in. You can use it to carve away the foam and that's why you need a thicker piece of foam. It's amazing, it just carves straight into the um, foam like it's butter. Now, it isn't great foam dust. So you do need to put on full goggles and um, face mask or it will get into your lungs. And what you need to do now is just use this sanding drum to medium grit just to smooth off the edges and to carve in all of those recesses that you need in a rock face. So I stuck all my bits of foam on and I started to get my rock face and this is still very draft and then I looked at it and I thought there's nowhere really to put my doll. I managed to get rid of most of the front end. It was a very vertical, I never quite meant it to be vertical like that. I just wasn't happy. Nope wasn't doing anything for me. So out came the knife again and I carved into that giant big square lump of useless diorama to make it look a little bit better. Then I cut up the existing rock face that I made and put it all back on again. And before I got seriously into the dremeling, I got out some of that foam clay. Here's a really cheap one with balls in. I didn't like this, but it was great just to add some padding and actually it dremels up quite nicely. Um, and so I used it in places like the shelf where, and I used it to fill the tops where I had some quite big gaps. And it does all eventually come out. It kind of sticks to itself in a really satisfying way. And this is all kids, it's either silk clay or foam clay. Now this was obviously the metallic set and they all stick to each other quite well. You can put a little bit of water on if it's not sticking to your foam, but I found it all stuck really well. And every now and then I got out my snake just to check that um, he would sit quite nicely on this ledge that I'm making for him and he's part of the diorama. The white one is the proper cosplay. And I have to say, this is the point where you hide all your sins. All those horrible little gaps and things that don't work, that's when you go through here and do this. Now I did do this in layers. You can see I've already dremeled this 
massively to get it where it was. And then I started to add extra little bits of foam on where I needed them and just to Dremel them. It is just a case of spending quite a lot of time on this. I probably could have spent hours more. And if I was doing a smaller scale, I might have done. But for this scale, actually, it doesn't need to be overly detailed. Once it's had a while to dry out and this has had a week, um, that foam clay does Dremel really nicely. So you can use it to add exactly the same texture as you put onto your flat pieces of foam and just build it all up. Now a Dremel is good for big, large texture, but I wondered about adding in some finer texture just with a knife. When I did my brickwork with this, all you do is put a hot gun across it and all the cracks open up. So I did some cracks on here I'm in two minds whether I really like them or not. So I didn't do perhaps as many as I could, but I did go around and put a few deeper fissures on using a knife. Well, once you've got the heat gun out, run it all over the rest of your foam and it will just make all the little cell pockets in the foam go shrink and it seals it. But to actually paint it, we now need to put product on it to prime it. And for this, I'm actually using FlexBond. It's a cosplay product, but a lot of people use wood glue. I've tried PVA. It's okay, but if you dent it, it will crack. Um, whereas this remains a lot more flexible, which is useful when you're going to wear it probably less so in a diorama. Any wood glue therefore, but the important thing is how you put it on. We need to stipple it into all the gaps so we've nice textured surface now. And I'm using a really big paintbrush. When that's dry, you can add a few rocks around the bottom if you want. I'm using Woodland Scenics Talus in coarse and extra coarse because it, it, I just happen to have it. And again, they're lightweight. They're made from expanded sort of, it was like a hydroponics type rock. I brushed on a little bit of PVA underneath to start. I find it's useful to have something under them. And then I dribbled on some diluted PVA glue, a one third glue, two thirds water mix, just so it would run and really set them down solid into the base. Now painting this is really simple. I start off with a base coat of Artist Acrylic warm grey because I don't like my cliffs to look too cool. Once that is dry I use Payne's grey which is a dark bluey grey to add some depth into the cracks and I just water it down maybe a drop of fairy liquid to get it to flow and just brush it all over let it drip and dry. After this I use some dilute quite thin wedgewood. It's kind of a bluey, light bluey gray and a big natural sponge. And I just dab it on all over. I add a bit of mid gray, which is a cooler, darker gray to the mix and dab that on too. I'm not bothered if the first coat has dried at this point. I add some raw umber to the mix to give it a bit of a brown feel, a bit of water because it was getting a bit thick and then dab that on with a sponge too. I left it to dry overnight until it was well and truly set. Now I also kept the original mix and added some more raw umber to it and painted that on. It looks horrendous, but not to worry. Using kitchen roll, dab it off until you're left with a lovely patterned rock surface. Yes, I made my tree out of toilet rolls. Excellent. Masking tape, toilet rolls, and a little bit of bonsai wire. These are formers that I'm going to use for the next layer, which is cellular clay, but it needs something roughly the right shape to stick to. So I use the bonsai um, wire to add some roots and to add branches. It's very easy to put in place for the roots and I used a little bit of hot glue to tack it in place. The branches are very simple to make with bonsai wire. It's very, very malleable and flexible. So you just twist it round, leave a loop at one end, which you bend over and use to attach it to the trunk with the masking tape, and then contort and twist it when it's in place to exactly as you want it to be. I use my wool to check that the branches fitted around it and everything would still fit together as a diorama. For larger branches, just add more and more strands, wrapping them around each other until you get the thickness you want. We will add quite a bit of thickness in later stages, so this is more for support. I added some generous amounts of hot glue at the bottom just to make sure everything stayed stuck. And um, my, my masking tape also has kept 
coming open. So I did use it on the trunk as well, just to hold some annoying bits of masking tape down and to give the branches just some extra support. I use Cellucé for the branch and trunk texture. It's beautiful for it. It's a paper mache project. So it just goes off overnight. You've got plenty of working time. I went out and left it with a plastic bag over it. It's great. I do add a dollop of white glue as well to give it a little bit of plasticity and bendiness. And I find it works really, really well. Um, for the branches, I actually just used neat glue and cellular clay to give it even more grip. Now this is the fun gloopy bit. You cover everything in cellular clay. As it dries, you can smooth it out a little bit. It gets a little bit firmer, so you can go back with a damp finger if you want and smooth it. Um, it's no substitute getting your fingers on for this trunk bit, but I did actually use a coffee stirrer for most of the application on the branches. Silly clay is great for building up things like roots, putting a little bit more texture onto your trunk. I really like the final texture that I got with it. So that's what I use for my bark. The other thing I will say is sometimes it can crack if you put it on too thickly. So try not to build it up massively, but I find adding the white glue helps prevent that. So this is the first layer dried and you can see I mostly just did the base trunk and the starts of the branches. Using a neat glue and cellular clay mix for extra adhesion, I put it on the branches. Now this is quite fiddly, but it is a large scale tree, so you do have to make the extra effort. Um, normally you might paint it on with a brush or something for technique for a smaller scale, but at this scale, this texture that the cellular clay provides is just, it's amazing. It's perfect for a haunted style, twisted, contorted oak. I use the cellular clay to just build up the top where the um, this is a trunk that's obviously been smashed or cracked at some point and to smooth out the sides so I had a nice bark effect. A day later and I'm adding a thinner mix, this is, has a lot more water in it, to just bulk out those branches. They all looked a bit twiggy and just it's easier to get it to stick and create a full branch around the bottom and the top with a slightly more liquid cellular clay mix. I needed to paint it to seal it and once it was dry I used the warm grey that I used as the base coat on the rocks. I do like to have um, similarities of tones through all of my dioramas so I'll try and use the same greens, the same greys, the same browns so that everything tones together and looks like it's meant to be there. Now I use that raw umber mix that I used as the last coat on my stonework and I'm going to use it in a very different proportion. I'm going to put a lot more of it on so everything's a lot darker. And because I've got this mid grey which is now thoroughly dry, that sits on the high points and this darker colour sits in the cracks. So I end up with a lovely multicoloured tree. And here we are with the brown on. So. It's time to get on with adding a little bit of muted green, lichen, etc., into this scene. This is built up of many layers, but the first is this olive green water mixable oil colour. And I put a small splodge in and a lot of water and it doesn't quite mix. And you get quite a grainy effect, which sits and looks, to my mind, quite like lichen on the rocks. Now I've chosen to put this on one side of my rock face and into all of those cracks and crevices and also onto my tree. You can highlight areas you want more depth on by dabbing the tip of your brush into the neat oil mixable, well, water paint thing and dabbing it into the sort of areas that are deeper and more crevice-like. It's helpful to have real pictures here. But if you look at rock faces, quite often they are greener on one side, same on trees. And that's the north side in the northern hemisphere because it gets less sun, so it doesn't dry out all of this greenery. Finally, I did a little bit extra green just around the base of the whole tree. When that was all dry, I used another oil colour, water mixable, and it's a yellowish green. I put it on as before. Later that day, when it was dry, I added a sap green. Now this is a much darker green. It doesn't look it when you put it on, and I think it's because it's oil colour. It comes out milky, it dries a really nice green, as you can see here. The rocks are looking green. Time to put some earth and moss and vegetation in place. So, like all good modellers, I picked this up from my mum the other day when she was having some topsoil delivered. So I start off by brushing on some neat, 
just PVA glue, that's white glue. And the reason I put it on first is it just acts as a base coat to keep those bottom layers stuck. Um, otherwise, sometimes when you're dribbling from above, the bottom layers, they don't always get enough glue down to them. Once that's there, I sprinkle on some soil. Now this is the top soil from my mum's recent delivery. It's got little stones in, it's got little bits of branches or bark or whatever it is. So it's brilliant for this kind of earthy forest floor. I used a brush to get it right up to the edge, but you can just put it over a piece of paper and just sprinkle on and then collect what's left. I did the top to give the wolves something nice and soft to stand on. And it's worth spending a little time getting it around the bottom of these tree roots so that um, they bed into the soil, rock, whatever, because that dark tree this side would grow on something that was just rock. I sprayed a section at a time with a mix of isopropyl alcohol and water. That's 99% isopropyl alcohol and I put one third alcohol, two thirds water and put it into a little pump bottle and use it to spray. This is really used to dampen everything so that the glue flows through it. Without this, the glue will just bead and ball on the surface. And if ever your glue starts to do that, then it means you need to put a little bit more water, isopropyl alcohol mix on. Next up is gluing it down. And for this, I used a mix of about a third white glue, PVA glue, two thirds water. And um, because we sprayed the isopropyl alcohol, it sinks in very nicely. Now, just be careful when you're dripping it. If you do it too viciously, you can move the earth, um, which isn't ideal. So a nice gentle dripping, and I soak it quite a bit. I'd rather put too much on than too little, and I wanna make sure it's well stuck. I wanted the bottom of my rocks to be really mossy, so I painted on neat PVA, this is just washable PVA, white glue. Without that, anything that you put on will just fall off because these are far too steep. To represent the moss, I'm using Blended Turf by Woodland Scenics. I like this colourway because it's got more than one blend of green in there, so it's not uniform. And then I just sprinkle it on with my fingers. After a while, I got bored of that and got out a teaspoon and put it on a much thicker layer. I was actually looking for some depth. Another quick spray of isopropyl alcohol and water to thoroughly soak it. I know you know what's coming next. Yep more dilute white glue. I just dripped it on, but I found something really exciting when I was about halfway through. Normally I try and avoid dislodging the greenery, but I got a bit carried away and oops, I created a river and it slumped some of the moss downhill. Well, that was fine actually. I liked the effect it created. So I carried on doing that in other locations to try and get the um, rivers to just show a little bit of the stonework that was underneath. The finished result was a little bit better than just a completely moss covered rock. It made it look like maybe something had scrabbled up there or it had been weathered slightly, which I guess is the effect we're after. At this point, I thought I'd better try my wolves in place to make sure their feet touch the ground because obviously this isn't quite a flat and they're not quite flat either. So where they didn't touch the ground, which was a couple of places, I just put on a bit of extra soil and you guessed it, I sprayed it with isopropyl alcohol and added some more glue. And that way I knew that my wolves were gonna bed down very nicely. Just need to remember to put them back in the same order. Now, before I tell you where I got this lovely mix of um, bits from, do tell me in the comments below if you do something similar. I picked this up on the side of the road. Yes, I went to a restaurant and on the way there, I saw this lovely pile. I think it's a silver birch tree and it drops these little leaves that you can see here. So I thought, oh, I'll get some of those on the way back, hence the, in a serviette from that restaurant. But it's great. It's got some big leaves in there which you need to filter out, plus a few little bits of modern rubbish. And I wash my hands well after handling it, but it's been in that for a good year or two waiting for the right project. So I just liberally sprinkled it on and it's great. It's got little bits of fiber and twigs and the odd rock and leaves, loads of these little mini leaves. Now these are actually out of a silver birch tree's cones and they're brilliant for dioramas like this, as long as you don't mind the fact they look like little maple leaves. But at this scale, I thought about printing oak leaves and I did actually buy a lot of oak leaves and I may put one or two in, but blooming heck, they're expensive to buy and I couldn't afford to do this kind of effect with leaves. And I was struggling to find something I could do at home where I would cut these out. I could do it, I've done it before, but um, it's not actually as good as just this stuff I picked up out the gutter. 
I left a space for the campfire and you guessed it, I sprayed it with isopropyl alcohol and water to make sure all my glue would go in. Then I covered each of those individual leaves, I put a drop of glue on them to make sure they'd stick and I doused it liberally with white glue diluted. Now as you can imagine this meant a lot of it ran off the edges and this diorama is currently sat over my sink dripping away quite merrily. Um, there's a lot of glue running off by the time I've done this and I've done the bit at the top as well. But I want them all to be stuck and they're quite deep and I'd be worried that they would fall off. It also settles them down a bit because when the glue goes on them they just sink a little so it looks a little bit more realistic. Once the top had dried enough so I could put some kitchen roll down, I went and added some moss to the trees. Now I just used a thick tacky glue for this, it's just a thicker white glue, because I wanted it to stay on the top of the branches and not drip, and I wanted it to have a little bit of depth to it, a little bit more thickness perhaps. And I literally smeared it along the top of the branches and sprinkled on the turf, the same material as we used on the rock face. So this is really easy to do. I sprayed a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on just to let the glue wick up a little bit but it is tacky glue so it's only the bottom layer that's going to get stuck. I found my bottom rock moss came out quite flat in the end because it got a lot of glue through it and it causes it all to bed down so I wanted to make sure that my final sprinkle on this particular layer was dry so that it was a little bit fluffier. I also put some moss around the bottom of the tree and made sure it didn't cover the leaves. I actually went back and sprinkled a few more on where they'd got a little bit too green. Finally I put some on the trunk itself. I did struggle to get it to stick to the tacky glue on the trunk so I ended up blowing it to whisk it on. Um, I blew a lot sideways as well as you can see. Whoops. Yeah at some point I did actually get it on the tree. Yeah at some point. Finally, to tie the tree in a bit more, I went and added some more moss onto these open bare rock faces. So not where their leaves are, but where there's just plain gray rock face at the top here on the flat sections. So I just used tacky glue, sprinkled on some more of the green blend turf, and finally sprayed with isopropyl alcohol to draw the glue through. So onto the final stages, those big vegetation like ferns. Now I'm not doing bracken that by autumn would be a golden brown colour like the leaves, I'm doing ferns that live in green moist areas and in the UK they stay green all year round. I went to my local craft store Hobbycraft and I picked up these artificial ferns. Now they're a little big for any scale I might model in but if you cut those individual leaves off you can make some really exciting cheap and quick ferns. On this really simple one I just pulled off the leaves. On this more complicated fern I used the tips as individual leaves and then as I got further down each of the side fronds became its own set of leaves. It all makes sense in a sec. This next stage is so much easier if you have a zapper or a blaster or a kicker and it basically makes super glue set really quickly. I put mine in a little dropper bottle for precise application and I squeeze my super glue out onto a spare bit of card for the same reason. The super glue is not an ideal glue because these are quite a waxy plastic and they don't really stick to it but it has the advantage that it sets immediately with the zapper so you can put these together quite delicately, put a drop of the zapper on and it will hold them. Now, because super glue is not ideal for them, I find it easier to put a little sort of rim around the stem of each piece of fern and then the super glue is actually sticking to itself. Once you get a hang of the glue, it's actually really simple. Start with the largest leaves, put two or four together, build up each layer at a time and finish with a little top knot of almost vertical leaves which just hide the fact that your center is all just butted up. I sprayed them with some matte sealant just because there was a few spots of super glue and they were a little bit shiny from the plastic and it just got rid of that shiny look and then I just moved them around until I was happy with them on the diorama. Next up was painting my 3D printed snake and I just got this off Thingiverse and the references below. I used Tamiya fine grey primer just to give it a nice base coat and sprayed with a plastic coat brown. Then I used desert yellow to paint on the sort of patterns on the back. You see I've got my phone out for reference and this is just a British Viper. I know the head's a bit big for that but I liked that diamond pattern on the back. 
finally, I put on a brown wash. This is just a AK Interactive streaking grime. It's quite brown and it's a slightly different solvent so it won't take off any of the acrylic paint underneath and it just gives everything a little bit more depth. Lastly, I did the mouth with some Vallejo Pale Flesh and I did the teeth with some white. And when it was all dry, I sprayed it with some satin clear sealant. One of the final details was the campfire. Now I made this from real wood twigs that I picked up on a walk one day. They've been drying for a while, so they burn ever so easily. I did find they burnt just a white ash. So I spent a bit of time just charring some of the edges to have a little bit of black on there. Otherwise they literally just burnt away to nothing. And I just arranged them in a pyramid when they'd cooled a little bit so that they look like a typical campfire that you might see. I was in two minds whether to glue or not, but in the end I did with a normal mix of isopropyl alcohol and then dilute white glue. You know the story. Then it was just a case of adding in those final details. These all came with the two ladies that I now have, so they were just put in place. I haven't glued them in case I change my mind about where I want them later on. So here we are, the final diorama, and I'm really pleased how it came out. Those finishing touches really help. Um, I got the extra figure as well. She's actually in chains, which you can't particularly see. And I think it all works really well for showing off these two amazing figures, which was the point. Plus, I love these wolves. Check out Printed Obsession's work. No affiliate or anything. I just really like his work. And uh, yeah, I'm really pleased. The tree, the contorted tree, just looks so dead and amazing. It's brilliant. Uh, it's just, um, it's perfect. And I'm certainly going to be using that technique again. Um, yeah, really, really happy how everything turned out. Well, all I need to do now is take the photos and thank my patrons who support me. They got more detailed build videos as I went along, so they've seen this one coming for quite a few months. But here we go. Finished diorama.